Okay, well, um, I've been asked to wrap up the conference uh, by trying to draw together some of the themes, uh, threads of the day, and also, you know, to add something of my own uh, input. Um, I've been involved in working on men's issues and masculinity and gender equality, child abuse, issues about men's violence against women for over 25 years now. And I've done that as an academic, a social worker. I've been in loads of men's groups over the years. Um, I was involved with MOVE actually in Ireland when it, in the early days when it was setting up and developing. Um, and I also stand here uh, as a father of a 12-year-old girl. Um, I've got two stepdaughters and two stepsons who are in their 20s and 30s, and I'm a partner to my wife Claire. So as um, we've already been talking about, these are deeply personal issues as well as uh, professional ones. Um, as we've heard today, the problem that we came here to talk about, the primary problem that we came here to talk about and address uh, men's violence against women is a huge social problem. 42,000 women abused by men in 2012. Michael's figures from this morning included the horrific observation that um, more women die as a result of violence from men in the 15 to 44 age category than from any other cause. Um, so these are major, major social problems um, and that's a really important reason why we're here, obviously. Um, but the tone of the conference uh, that was set initially by Greg in his opening remarks uh, and his welcome and from Michael, wherever he is, um, were positive, yeah? Um, the comment from the last session where someone from Norway thought that we were 35 years behind uh, what they're doing in Norway, um, well I reckon that 20 years ago we were about 100 years behind <laughs> what they were doing in Norway. Um, because I want to continue really with the, the sort of tone of optimism. You know, these are really, really hard issues to address. Um, but I think we've done it in a really uh, civilized, um, respectful way. It's a 50-50 split, I gather, roughly. Um, so I think the fact that we could come together like this in this way in itself uh, is a measure of how the whole debate around gender and violence has moved on. Yeah? And when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today and thinking about it during the conference, um, what, we, what I think we really have to recognize is that what, what has happened today is really the, the latest manifestation of a, of a journey that's been going on for 20, 25, 30 years. White Ribbon Campaign started in 1991. Um, the so-called men's movement, as we used to call it, or it used to get called in the 80s, you and your first men's group in 1971, is that right, Alan? Yeah. Um, started in the 70s and 80s. We used to get slagged a lot. Um, I remember I did quite a lot of media work in the, in the 90s because the, the media got interested in men as well. Tree huggers especially. You know. um, and Sean Moncrief uh, did this really odd uh, RTE television program on a Friday and Saturday night that co coincided with where the pubs were. Um, emptied out, and myself and Hugh Arthurs uh, went on, and Sean said, I'm in the men's movement. He said, I'm a man, and I have a movement every day. <laughs> but, the joke worked well for him at that time. Um, so I think, in all seriousness, I think um, two things really stand out for me about how things have developed and about today. And the first one is that we've come to understand a lot more about gender relations, men and masculinity. The whole man question, what it means to be a man, and the whole place of violence in that. And secondly, we've learned a huge amount, I think, about how to engage men, how to get them interested in signing up to things like uh, men's groups, uh, white women campaigns, and how to engage women too. Um, because a lot of women have historically been very skeptical 
and still are, and some have been hostile. Um, so, I want to address these two points, um, or two themes, in the time that I've got. Um, so we've got a 25-year body of knowledge now. Academics, researchers began studying men in the 1980s. Um, so there's a huge kind of academic literature on men. There's a literature and a whole body of experience on working with men. So, it seems to me that what we've really kind of recognized today is that manhood, masculinity, it's not a fixed condition. Boys are born with the same capacity to love and care for others and themselves as our girls. How it turns out for boys has little or nothing to do with testosterone. I don't buy that argument. Michael gave a slightly sophisticated interpretation of how it might have some impact in some modest way. Um, but it's really down to how boys are reared, how we're conditioned to be men, and the kind of culture and relationships with other boys and girls within which we experience growing up and so on, and our lives as men. And all that training we get that Michael uh, referred to, um, which gives us all these messages, all this information about how to be a man. Something else that we've learned more about is that men are not all the same. Yeah? There are important differences between men and indeed this notion of masculinity. It may surprise some here to think that this even applies to sex. Yeah? Now we all know that the cliche is that men are supposed to be only interested in one thing, and that's sex. Yeah? That's all we think about, apart from the men's Irish rugby team. <laughs> in 2006, Fergus Hogan from Waterford Institute of Technology and I published a study we did for the Crisis Pregnancy Agency where we interviewed 45 heterosexual Irish men about their sex lives and their attitudes and behavior around contraception and preventing unplanned pregnancies. And we found quite a lot of variation between men uh, about their whole sexual practices. Some men were shy and hesitant. And they emphasized the importance to them of being decent men. This is a quote from a 34-year-old married professional man. I think my sex, sense of sexuality and all that would have been tied up in a sort of in, a, in, in sort of a sense of decency. You know, decency could allow you to make love or have sex before you marry her. But you know, you had to treat her right, kind of thing. You know that feeling. So these were a group of men we um, concluded that relate their sexuality and their masculinity to love and the well-being of their partner. They are essentially respectful to women with whom they negotiate sexual activity and behave responsibly should a crisis pregnancy occur. So here we have, in what I've just quoted, the voice of men which shows how men are capable of remarkable acts of love and devotion within their families, with their friends at work, <coughs> in the bonding that they do do when they do that, like Paul O'Connell did. Yeah. There isn't a man in this room who doesn't know what that feels like to be part of a group of men. Feeling that sort of closeness with other men. So most men, most of the time, are decent. Yeah. I found the courage to say that the majority of men are not violent. I think I used to imply in the 90s that the messages were a bit more blurred about that in the 90s, let me put it like that. But as we've heard today, there's a lot more going on. Fergus and I found another group of men for whose sex mattered a lot and which they used, used to define themselves as men. This is a 22-year-old uh, single man who worked in a nightclub uh, in the bar. Quote, you know the way girls go on anyway. They come back from the pub and they're locked, and you're locked. Now, for those who are visiting from overseas, locked means. What does locked mean? You're jarred. You're <laughs> langers. 
They come back to the pub and they're locked, and you're locked in yourself anyway. You don't give a shit if you're wearing a Johnny or not, because, well, you should, but back three or four years ago when we were in college, you didn't give a shit because, oh, I'll shag this one. And, it's, and that's it, kick her out of the bed later. That was your attitude in college. Lads, oh, what did you get last night? Or what was she like? You know. But to be honest with you, not being vain now, but it's over 200 women I've had. Seriously. So, men in this category saw, them, saw their sexuality and their identity as testosterone driven and out of control. If a woman insisted they wore a condom, they took no responsibility for using contraception. If a woman didn't insist on them wearing a condom, they took no responsibility for using contraception. They showed little or no respect for women or regard for women's welfare. They were misogynistic men. They treated women as sexual objects with disregard. This is an example of a man, I think, who takes his power to behave like this, who takes sexism for granted. Is it a bit too close? And who expects other men to, to join in with them? Yeah. So in the research interviews, when we were talking to this man, he kind of expected us to join in with the banter with him, because that's what he saw as the normal way that men related to one another. So I've just given you two stories about two types of men, and it's interesting to consider which of these stories is the most common one that men tell. Well, as you've heard today, it tends to be the decent guys who keep quiet, silent, well, the gung-ho, I'm getting it four times a night sort of bloke. That's the dominant kind of conversation uh, that we tend to have in this culture. In general, the young men we interviewed, in general, the men we interviewed as young men growing up felt under pressure to not only be heterosexual, but to prove it. Many did this by boasting of sexual conquests, which exaggerated or lied about the truth. They bragged to their mates about having sex when they hadn't had sex at all. Homophobia and fears of violence or rejection from other boys and men. They were afraid of being perceived to be gay, so they tried to prove their heterosexuality by talking about it. They were afraid of violence from their peers, and many had experienced such violence. So what we've learned from this, and it's been you know, a very prominent theme of the day, is that Boys and men police one another's behavior, and they let them know if they aren't complying with the dominant norms and ideals of masculinity. And they punish men for appearing vulnerable or being seen to betray other men. And this is the kind of sexism which forms part of the context within which some men act out violence, crimes of sexual and physical violence against women are minimized, Prosecutions are low, there are poor conviction rates, and some feminists say we live in a rape culture. As Shea Franklin put it so well, so how do we navigate these rapids? How do we find the words, the language, the grammar, the tone of voice to challenge sexist comment and behavior, and still find a way to belong, to feel that we belong as men? It took huge courage, I think, for, for Shea to stand up and say that. And I hope that today has got us closer to answering that. And the last session, for instance, where Michael addressed some of those issues, I think was very helpful. And we've learned a lot today, or heard a lot about what can happen when men find the courage to say no. On my table, I had a really good debate about, you know, the, or discussion about the fact that we've got to learn and we've got to find the courage or We've got to be mindful about these things in our personal lives. Yeah. So my 12-year-old daughter on Facebook, is there anybody here who has children or is, is uh, in contact through their jobs or their lives with young people will know about the impact of Facebook and social media? 
I've already had to try and protect my daughter from young men who make really offensive comments about her breasts and so on and so forth. Yeah. So as Shay said, you know, the internet and so on presents all sorts of new challenges. Yeah. So these are deeply personal as well as uh, professional matters. The tone of the conference has been, as I said, positive. Um, Greg said he'd like to hear about transformation. Um, and I think he's right. And I hope that there have been some important there has been some important learning during the day about how we can transform both our own personal lives and transform relationships, organizations, and so on towards greater equality. The best answer I think I can give to our around what might be transformative, or what I really want to emphasize in the time that I've got, is the importance of us having a deep understanding of the capacity men have to change. I'm not convinced, certainly in the wider culture, I, don't, I think we still have a very kind of fixed view of men and masculinity um, that is biologically determined. Yeah. You're born a man, you've got all this testosterone, da -di -da -di -da, and you're set on this course, and you'll end up playing rugby for Ireland, or you won't sort of hope men in any other context or whatever, <laughs> other than when they score a goal or a try or whatever, and if you do, you're gay. Right? Um, so, I think we have to really, it's a radical thing to do, to challenge this kind of fixed notion of masculinity, I think. It's a transformative thing to do. So I want to sort of draw to a finish by really emphasizing a little bit of what I've learned about the capacity that men have to change, the capacity that men have to care and to develop as ethical persons. Yeah. And because this is about violence, and it's also about ordinary non-men who don't use violence, this is about emphasizing the importance of toughness in response to the men who use violence, and love in respect of those who, to our knowledge, do not. Which brings me to my second theme, what we've learned about the need to find ways to have a method to engage men. And we've learned an awful lot, I think, over the last 20, 25 years about how to effectively work with men. I was involved in several things in the 90s and we got it wrong. That doesn't mean we still won't get it wrong, but I think we have learned a lot. And I want to say a few things about fatherhood in particular because it's a very good example, I think, of how we've seen some transformation in our own lifetime in how men are, as particularly in relation to caring. The Equalities Agency in the UK has published research which shows that men are now doing one third of childcare. One third of the care that goes on in typical families in the UK is done by men. Now, as many women point out, that doesn't mean they're doing the same amounts of housework. But they are, it used to be 10 minutes a day, I think, in the 70s, fathers devoted to their children. The average, the average is out now at about a third. I recently evaluated a program in England that had been developed to work with teenage mothers. This program employed what they called family nurses who visited the mothers at home before, they, before the birth and for two years after the birth. And I was asked, my colleague Peter Gates and I were asked um, to find out um, what these family nurses were doing to engage fathers and whether they were having any impact upon them. So, I'm not going to go into too much technical detail, and I need to be quick about this, but we gathered information on 144 fathers um, who were known to the, the, this family nurse program. And what we found was that the majority of these men were very vulnerable, they were unemployed, they hadn't achieved at school, they were either inv involved in crime or on the edge of crime, and some were, had been uh, and, and actually were in young offenders' institutions or prison. Many had poor relationships with their own fathers, 
and some had been abused in childhood. We interviewed a sample of these fathers um, who had all become new fathers within, within the previous year. And the striking thing was how becoming fathers had changed them. This is a quote from an 18-year-old uh, father of a seven-month-old baby girl. I used to be a bit stupid when I was out, getting into trouble. I used to be out with my mates, and I used to drink when I used to go out sometimes. But I don't do that, any, that anymore. Once he was born, I just didn't seem to do any of that anymore. Or want to do it anymore. I don't know what. Well, it must have been him being born that changed it, but I just stopped. What we concluded was that the family nurses succeeded with these men because they, ta they tapped into the, the men's desire to be good men and fathers at the very time when they were making the transition to change into being fathers. They gave the men time. They treated them with respect. They taught them things about how to care for their babies. They helped them with their relationships with their partners. There were lots of struggles about parenting styles and housework, all the usual stuff that we all argue about. Or I do, anyway. Um, and the men we interviewed um, were incredibly positive about this program family nurse visits, and everything that it had done to help them to become better fathers and men. This is an 18-year-old father of an eight-month-old baby girl. Yeah, it was kind of weird. Obviously, you've got this little baby, and you're holding it, and you don't want to drop it. You don't want to drop her. Yes, the family nurse teaches you about that. Yeah. Before, my baby was born. The nurse brought round a baby, a fake baby, and she was telling me how to hold it and stuff like that. Now, many of these men were deeply ambivalent about receiving help. As one 31-year-old father of a 13-year-old child said, in the beginning, I would go up and hide in the bathroom so I did not have to speak to her. But after a couple of times we spoke, and she was a lovely lady, and I was dead, it was dead easy to get on with her. So it's interesting, that's something we haven't got into today, is like the gender issues around who should be working with men. Um, this was a workforce that was mainly women. Um, and it's interesting that, um, well, we found it significant that some of these women didn't really get the whole issue of masculinity and how men struggled to acknowledge their need for help. So when some of the men disappeared into the bedroom, um, that was perceived by the professionals as disinterest. The ones who did get it were proactive in going after the men. The men for whom this intervention worked, they weren't violent men. But the support and positive messages they got about themselves as caring men surely helped to minimize any risk that they could be. Crucially, it seems that they were helped to take the developmental pathway to develop as men along a path into being loving, respectful fathers and men. I'm thinking back to the conversation we had uh, before I came on. These were very marginalized men. And one of the reasons they were effectively engaged was because these professionals listened to them in the way that Michael and others uh, with wisdom like that in the room and experience uh, said it's really important to do. And when you meet inspirational men like these, you can see how a light has gone on for them. They get it. They can see how a capacity to be caring, loving men was threatened and to some extent knocked out of them at school, in their families, in their competitive relationships with other men. Creating light bulb moments 
is crucial to empowering men to be interested in gender equality. For the men who are known to use violence, um, one thing I learned from my involvement with MOVE, and it's well reflected in the academic research literature and so on, for the men who are known to use violence, this light bulb moments, to use that phrase, have to involve making them accountable for their crimes. Men who use violence, the research and practice experience suggests, don't change unless they take responsibility for their violence. If they're traumatized men who've had really you know, abusive childhoods and so on, they must take responsibility for their violence if they're going to change, and then we can do some work with them on the impact of that trauma and so on. So it's obviously crucial that the uh, services like MEND, MOVE, and the other ones that have been mentioned today, 13 programs nationally seems to me to be from the starting point of, I think, one in the 90s, uh, like progress. But that doesn't mean that that isn't enough. And obviously any campaign to end men's violence has to involve and include um, initiatives and pressure to develop services for women, for, for, for abusive men, and also, of course, um, services for abused women and indeed children. But for men in general, Transforming gender relationships, creating greater equality, creating more loving men, if you like, involves, I think, or has to involve, appealing to men's hearts, appealing to their interests, helping men to see what their babies, their sisters, their mothers, their brothers, their fathers, and so on, to see what they themselves have to gain. From, to gain from making the kind of changes that we've been talking about today. This conference is a hugely important step in the efforts to achieve gender equality in Ireland. I was really struck by the comment from the floor about how it feels different now, um, or it feels like what we've constituted today is, is a community of practice, if you like. I've always liked that word. I'm from a social work background, um, and I try and think of ways of trying to articulate what we need to do as professionals to come together with lay people, with people who've been affected by violence, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think the idea of a community of practice is, 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 is a, could be a useful way of expressing this. So this has been an important event, I think, in providing the opportunity for a dialogue um, which has been very respectful to men, actually. One of the fear, based on my historical experience, I've been at events like this where there's been outbreaks of like, uh, War, you know, gender war. You know, I see people nodding. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why I was so scared before I actually came to this event and I was feeling so anxious about it. I had visions that I might that I might actually have to speak because it would have all broken up <laughs> um, in some kind of um, chaos. I think the reason that that hasn't happened, uh, so I want, to, I want to finish really by acknowledging, um, I know Alan in his introductory remarks said some very kind things about his and I relationship, but these are completely objective comments. I want to acknowledge and recognize the brilliance of the Men's Development Network and its uniqueness. Michael Kaufman, who's spoken in something like 45 countries, was commenting last night, 
on how unique it is to have an organization working with men, both with men who use violence, and then they've got a separate program that works with men who are very, very vulnerable and need all kinds of help and support. This is a, a, a genuinely innovative organization that is carving out a methodology, a way of working with men. Some, a lot of it is in this book, which I gather is on sale outside for 20 euro. Um, it's just out, isn't it? Um, and what I think is really so impressive about them is the way that they've done it so quietly and with such humility, as well as with such success. So they've modeled a way of working with men, where they've got on with it without sort of trying to create that sort of heroic story about men who go out and rescue people and so on and so forth. Could I ask for a round of applause for the Men's Development Network? into it. Um, there's a lot to be depressed about in post-Celtic Tiger Ireland, but there are grounds for real optimism and hope, as I've been saying. A truly aspira inspirational aspect of this conference is the way that Michael Kilbride brought the boys from his school, and the wonderful young men that he brought here who wrote and read their poems. These are phenomenal boys who are growing into phenomenal men. And I'm going to end with a poem, and it's about women, and it's by Maya Angelou, Maya Angelou, and it's called Phenomenal Women. And you'll hope you'll, bear with me, I hope you'll get in a minute why I'm ending on the subject of women, although it should be obvious. I'm just going to read two verses from a poem that has uh, four verses in it in the interest of time. Pretty woman, wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model's size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenal. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need of my care, because I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. That's the end of the poem, but I'm assured, I have reliable information that Maya Angelou added afterwards. Men are phenomenal too, but they have to write their own poem. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what today has been all about. <laughs>